what's going on guys welcome back today we are on the final video of the sql injection fundamentals before we get to the skill assessment so i'm going to finish this one then i'm going to do the skill assessment and then i'm going to post one video of all of them put together so if you really want to you can sit there and watch a four hour video or whatever it's going to be three hours whatever and go through the whole thing if that tickles your fancy so before we get into it i do want to Go ahead and tell you to hit the like and subscribe button. As you know, I, I got to say it. I got to say it. Um, I appreciate it. It's the only way I, I my channel grows. The other thing I want to point out is I did record this video and post it yesterday. And if anyone uses OBS, you know, sometimes it just changes your settings. And it changed my settings and I didn't record any audio. So I ver verified this time and I'm double verifying right now that there is audio, so we should be good. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So MySQL fingerprinting. So if you remember where we left off last time, we just finished the union injections, and now we're gonna go into the fingerprinting. So what that means is trying to identify what SQL database we're using and what tables, columns, and what schemas or databases we're using as well. So you can see here that you say here, as an initial guess, if the server is using Apache or Nginx, then it's a good guess that it's using something like MySQL, right? Because that's the database management system. Now, if it's Microsoft, it's probably using MS SQL. So these are the reason this is important is because everything you're, they're going to show here has pretty much an equivalent, whether it's the same exact command or not, it's, it's an equivalent in the alternative. So if you remember, we already did this at version and we got that Mariah database there. So you remember that? That's what we're going to be going off of. So we're going at that conclusion that that's what this is. As we know, if you remember also, we validated before that there's four columns that we have to match in order to do a union statement. And one of them was here that we don't see. The other one was this, then three, then four. So there was a total of four that we had to do. And that is why we know we're going to be using that payload the whole way through. We're just changing what we're looking for. So first thing, I'm going to start the instance. I'm going to go ahead and down here and start the actual this bad boy so we don't have to wait on it go back up okay and so first thing we have to do is get the information schema so what that means is we're going to ask ask the database information schema for information about the database about the schema right so what it's saying here is you can do union select so this is what it would look like if you're just doing it directly on the server select everything from my database dot users right but we're not going to do that because we don't have access directly to the server, right? We are using a SQL injection. So we're going to use this schemata. So what you do is the table schemata. It's a table in the database. As you can see, information schema right here. We're going to be using that table to gather information about the database. So you can see we say select everything schema name. So we want the schema name here from information schema dot schemata. And you can see right away it's going to grab us that and list all the schemas here so these are all the databases but the reality is we're doing this on a union select statement or so we don't do this on the directly on the server but we need to know what query we need to actually use so you can see here's their payload they're using cn you can use whatever you want there then they're saying union select and they're saying one then they want the schema name and then they got to finish the columns because if you remember we have to match the same amount of columns that they're asking for if you don't do that then you know what happens it won't work at all and it will tell you in improper matching so then they're saying schema name then they're saying three and four from information schema dot schemata and what that's going to do is that's going to actually ask this information schema for the list of schema names and you see we get them right here we get information schema il freight dev performance schema and MySQL. Now, the nice thing is we some of these we know are going to be um, generic or defaulted, right? So we see two databases, IL Freight and Dev. So there's IL Freight, there's Dev. The rest are all default, meaning that they already come in pre-installed. So we don't have to worry. Yes, we could use them to gather information, information like we are with information schema. And that's, and the reason we use that is because we know that that is going to be in this database language. So we know we can pull information from it. So therefore why not use it? Because otherwise we have to know the names of the columns that we're trying to pull. So that leads us to our next point is how do we get the columns once we have the database, right? So you can see they're using the union select one database two, three. Now you may say, why are they doing this? 
it's to figure out what database are we currently in. So when you do a search on here and you're searching for CN or whatever it is, excuse me, when you're doing that search, you need to know what database are we currently in that we're running these commands on? Because if we're in dev or whatever, right, we're going to get different information. So we know if we do the select database there, it will print out what database we're currently in. And we're currently in the ill freight database. So that's great, but we're actually going to start grabbing information from dev. That's what it wants us to do in this example. And you can see we say, okay, how do we get the tables? So we know the, the database already. We got that. And each time we have to match those columns, one, two, three, four, right? And we know we're in ill freight. So we're going to have to ask for dev every time because that's the ta table that we're looking at or the um, database that we're looking at. So now you can say union select one because you got to always specify one, two, three, four, right? And then we want the table name, right? Because we want to list the table name and the table schema. So what table and what schema is it in? right? And then we say four. And then we say we want it from and if you look, we use the information tables or information schema again. And we say dot tables. So now we're going to say, ask the information schema for the list of tables, where where the schema equals dev. So only give us the dev schema, right? And you can see here's a list of the different credentials or I mean of the different columns or tables, excuse me, in the database dev. So you can see there's the validation that they're all in dev and there's a table called credentials, one called posts, one called framework and one called pages. So now we know the, the name of the tables. So now we can go into the tables and start listing off the columns. So now we change it. It's the same payload, but we just change it from tables to column name. And then we want to list the table that it's in and then the table schema. You don't have to list these because you know they're in there, but it's nice because it validates what you're looking at, right? And then you scroll over and you say it's from information schema dot columns instead of dot tables, where table name equals credentials rather than where up here, where table schema equals dev, we're saying where table name equals credentials because we know the name of the table now. So now we simply say, okay, cool. We asked it for now all the column names and the table names and the table schema, excuse me, all three of them from everything in the credentials table. So all we have is we have a username and password. Those are the two columns in that table. So that's pretty easy because that means we only have two things we have to look for username, and password, username, and password. That's it. Well, luckily for us, we actually have three things that we can print out here if we use these columns. So that's easy enough. We can say, okay, union select again, same payload one list the username and list the password from, and you notice we say dev dot credentials. So we're telling it in the schema dev, go to the credentials and list username and password. And you can see there they list them. So now here's the nice thing. If we go to the website now and we're going to go right here, copy. All right, make this larger. Okay, so now it says search for a port. Well, we can just copy this exact thing because we, if you look, it tells us what is the password hash for new user stored in the users table. Okay, but if you notice, so let's go ahead and copy this because we ha they have our payload for us, so we don't have to get crazy with it. There we go but we have to change it. Nope. Didn't mean to do that. Go here. We have to change it. There we go. Uh, I just copied it twice. All right. We're all over the place here. Okay. There we go. So the big thing is one, we don't need the dev credentials, right? Because if you remember, we're already in the ill freight database. That's where we're located. That's where this is actually pulling from. And if you read, it's asking us to get it from the ill freight database. We're already in that database. So if you've been working on this and you've been getting weird results and you're using that dev database, that's why. So we're just gonna ask for the username and the password, right? From, oh, 
it doesn't have a username list. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and back and let's look at what we need to actually do. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab. So we know we're, we need to be in the ill freight database. So we're going to grab this. Let's see what it says. What is the password hash for new user stored in the users table? Okay, so we just need to get rid of the, the um, username and put users. So let's just grab users, right? Not because our user, not username. That's what it was. So if you look, it tells us new user stored in the users table. So we're going to say select one and we're going to say user because we need to know the user, right? And we want to know what's our current user for one. And then we want to say, and then four, right? Because we're going to go one. And then we need three because there's, you got to match all the fields. So one, three, four, we say search. And there's the root. So that's who we are, right? So right away, we know that we're root currently. Well, that helps us out a lot because that actually tells us we actually have unlimited permissions. We can do whatever we want here. So that's really good to know. And then we know, okay, so do, uh, I can't, I keep forgetting that's a, not a uh, thing. So now we say username, right? And password, but instead of this dev credentials, we want from users because that's the name right here of the table, users. So we don't have to put dot anything. The dev dot is something to access a different table. We're in the table we want. So we want username and password, and then make sure we get the comments out. Yep, commented out. There we go. And we want the new user one, right? Super easy, super simple. So there you go. And the reason you may have saw, asked why did you figure out if you're, or what user you are currently, it's because I wanted to see if I had permissions to actually access this stuff or not. Um, we They talk about that later on, but I wanted to do it because um, I actually got mixed up once on this when I was doing it before and I was on the, I spawned the wrong, um, this, I spawned, spawned the wrong one and was answering the question on the wrong one. So here is the new user, boom. Now we say submit, I already did that obviously. Again, I've recorded this video once before. So now we're gonna read files and this is where I jumped ahead actually. And you can see it says select user current we're trying to figure out if we have access to read a file. Well, I jumped ahead, right? I already knew, again, I've done this once, so I actually was jumping ahead, but I knew we need to figure out what user we are. Well, if we're root, you can do this if you want. You can select super privileges and all that to see if you have the super privileges, because that's what it's doing. It's telling you first, figure out what user you are, right? Once you figure it out, root, I've already figured that out. I am root, then I am group. No, I'm just kidding. Um, now select super privileges from my sequel. What this is to see if you have super privilege access. I'm not going to do that. You can feel free to do that. But knowing that we're root, I'm very confident that we have the privileges that we need. And you can see here, if you do it, you actually get a yes, meaning yes, you do have the super privileges. So that means we actually have super user privileges and we can do kind of whatever we want. And then you can see here, we can grant, right, our privileges. And what that is, it's just going to show you all the privileges and you can really go in here if you want and see if you have everything, but you have what we need because the one that we're looking for is this file privilege. That means we can mess with files on the system itself if it allows it, right? So keep in mind, whatever files you have access to on the system is dependent on the si the service or the account that is actually running the SQL database. So for instance, if you're using a low end user that doesn't have any privileges, to run a SQL database. If you take over that database, that's all the files they can access. Keep that in mind. So in this case, Etsy password is a, a globally readable file. So you can see they're saying select load file and they're just saying Etsy password. And when you do that here with the union select, like we have been doing like one, two, three, four, you actually can see the Etsy password file. Now, the reason they do this is because they want you to do a globally readable file just to see if it's possible. So always use something that you know is globally readable, like the Etsy password file. So now another example would be here. They're gonna load the file. They're gonna load var www.html search.php. And what that's gonna do, because you can see the default Apache web root is var www.html, fair enough. 
and the search.php is the script that is running. If you look at the source code of the, of the website, it's the script that's running this search function. Well, we want to read what is that script doing? So you can see when they do it, the difference is when they look at the source code, it'll actually be in there and it will be in there. Here's the best part with actually readable. The PHP script will be there readable. If you don't do it this way, if you just look at the source code, all you're going to see is PHP script. And when you try to access it, it's going to run it automatically and it's never, you're not going to be able to read it. So this gives you a chance to read it, which we're going to take advantage of here. So we see in the above PHP code that con is not defined. So it must be imported using the PHP include command. Check the imported page to obtain the database password. Okay, so let's go ahead and do what they did to look at the source code. So we're going to do this exact command. Copy it. Oops, scroll down. Paste it. Okay, now it doesn't look like we got anything, but if we hit Control U, we go down, scroll through. Wow, that's actually kind of blurry on my screen. Here you go. So if the is it get port code, da, da, select from everything from ports where code is like, da 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 da. And then you can see here's the con, right? And that's the whoops, and that's the con that they're talking about is not actually um, accessible. And you can see what, what they mean by that is are not accessible. I'm sorry, it's not predefined. So that's where they're saying, hey, if this isn't since it's not defined somewhere else in this code, it has to be defined somewhere. Well, luckily for us, it's defined somewhere else. Well, if you guys know PHP and you know how this works, 95% of the time, and I say that only because I'd never want to say 100% of the time, there's a config.php file. And this is going to actually tell these PHP scripts how to run, what to validate, all that stuff. And the nice thing is if we, oh, look at that. I didn't even have to actually do control U. Here's the script itself. And we got database username is root. Database password is database password is flag. So right there, we were able to pull that. And I get the question a lot, like, how would you know that? You know, how do you just know that? Whatever. That's just from experience from working with PHP and trying to read enough config PHP config files that typically that's where it's at. And you can see here, um, that's fine. It doesn't mean that you don't know anything or anything like that. You could easily look up um, Apache PHP configuration and figure out that the config file is right there. So it, it wasn't a guarantee that it was in there. That just happens to be how this box is done. So don't take it as me knowing more or anything like that. Just take it as, oh, now I know that there's a config.php file typically, and I can use that and access it uh, accordingly. So one thing I'll tell you here is now we'll go to the next. And when we do go to the next, I have to end this one. This is one I got, or I took too long on. There we go. And I'm just going to go down and spawn this one because I accidentally, this is the, this is the one I'm talking about. I accidentally spawned the wrong one and went to another step and thought it was the same box and it was giving me a in, incorrect permissions issue and I couldn't figure it out. So I had to um, break it down. So writing files, when it comes to writing files to the back end server it becomes much more restricted. This is true in, in modern database management systems since we can utilize this to write a web shell on the remote server. So what they're saying is we may not be able to write the file on the operating system, meaning we won't get a reverse shell on the operating system necessarily. But what we can do is we can use it to get a shell on the web application, which then is basically running commands on the back end for us. So what we're going to do, you're going to check. These are the things they're at saying, telling you to check. We require three things. User with file privilege. So again, we know we have file privilege. That is asking if the file, if meaning we can edit the files, um, the global secure file privilege variable is not enabled. What this means is, and you'll see, uh, users determine whether, yeah, so where to read, write from, files from. So what this does is if this is enabled, it will only allow you to read and write files from a specific secure file path. Okay. So if that's enabled, that means we can't step outside of it. So it's not really helpful for us to, to try this reverse shell now, or this shell in general, this web shell. 
Now, however, MySQL, because this is not a reverse shell, I apologize, but however, MySQL uses var lib MySQL files as the default folder. This means that reading files through MySQL injection isn't possible with default settings. Okay, even worse, some modern configurations default to null, meaning that we cannot read write files anywhere without the, within the system. Okay, so that's good to know. So let's see how we can find out the value. Well, we just say show variables like, that's if you're on the SQL server, but if not, you have to do a select or a union statement. And you can see, here's the union statement. It's union select one, we want variable name, variable value. And again, we're going back to the information schema and we're saying global variables, where the variable name is secure file privilege. And if you look, it's empty. What does that mean? Nothing in there. That means it's not, it's never been set. So we can actually use it. Now, select into an out file. So this is where we're gonna tell it, write something into an out file. Now you can see here, they selected everything from users and they put it into this out file, temp credentials. Okay, pretty cool um, because then we could go on the website and we could access this file theoretically, right? That's fine, but how does that help us, right? Well, that, that's what we come into next, right? So. Here, you can see this is all based on the server code, meaning if you are on the SQL database yourself and you say select this is a test into out file temp test.txt. This is just SQL language. And then if you cat the temp test.txt, there is a test file in there called this is a test. Now, um, and you can see it gives rewrite permissions across the board right off the bat. So that's nice. Um, and you can see this is a good little tip, advanced file export to utilize from base 64 in order to be able to write long advanced files, including binary. So what that means is you can export and write um, executables into from base 64 into files for yourself. So that way you can actually export them and they're only, um, they're only going to be in text. So it's actually a really nice um, tool. So now select files written successfully into out file. So this is just gonna say select file written successfully. And then you can see if you notice, look where they're writing them to var www.htmlproof.txt. So this shows proof of concept because if we're on the website and we go to var www.html slash proof.txt, which would just be the website slash proof.txt, then it should say file written successfully. If it does that, because you can see here's the union statement, union select file, and we'll do this right here just to show it, All right? Okay. So we go here and we go, let me copy this first. Because we had to spin up a new one, don't forget. Okay, there's that one. And then we'll go back up and we'll do this as, an, as a proof of concept because you always want to test things and show proof of concept before executing. Because if you just try to execute, 99% of the time, you're just, you're spinning your wheels because you're testing stuff and you're writing files to them every time. So we say proof text. Now we can go here instead of search.php and the, all this jazz, we can just say proof.txt, right? And if it worked, look at that file written successfully. And you can see, we also still have the one file written successfully, three and the four. So if we wanted to get rid of that, which we'll talk about here, you could just put quotes there instead of the one, two, three, and four, and that just would put an empty nothing in there, right? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna put this PHP system request zero. This is simple, simple, simple one line PHP shell. And what it's gonna do, you'll see here, we're gonna put it in. We're gonna write this to out file to shell.php. Now, some of you may say, what does this do? Well, this is saying PHP, use the system and run whatever zero is, right? And you can make that whatever you want. It doesn't have to be zero, but run whatever zero is. So you might say, well, what's zero? I'll show you. So if we go here and we say search, right? Now all that did currently is it wrote to the shell, right? The shell.php that we just created. So now instead of search.php, and we gotta get rid of all this crap again. And you can see that percent two, percent two, percent three, all that, that is URL encoded. So if you ever get stuck where you can't get something to work in a URL like that, take it to CyberChef and URL encode it. It'll save you a lot of time. Um, 
Okay, I don't know what happened. Did it freeze on me? Okay, the box might have froze on me. Okay. Let's see. I think it froze on me. All right, we'll start it back up, and we'll start from scratch, which is fine. If it froze, no big deal. We'll go through, and we'll talk about it here. So you're going to run this and re request, right? Run it, and you saw that we didn't get a response. That's good. No response means it ran. We didn't get an error. Now when you go to here, you go to the server, and you type shell.php because that's what you just wrote to. That was the out file you put. You make zero equal whatever command you want to run. So if we go here and we go back to here, there we go. And we say, here, I have made that full screen. It still didn't work. Okay, there we go. Now we go back to here. We copy this whole, this whole shebang. And we say search, you'll see that it actually, okay, it already exists because I didn't reset that, which is fine. So now we say do, 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 go here. We say shell.php. Now here's where you gotta get creative because we know it's looking for zero. That's what it's looking for. So we say zero equals, let's do something like ID, like it said before, or LS even, like it says before. Now you can see, look, I hit LS and look at that we get a list of all of the files in the current directory. So now it's telling us here, find the flag. Okay, well, let's find the flag. So this is where you can say ls and dot dot, right? Hit enter, boom, there's the flag. So some of you may say, well, what was that? Well, all I did was say shell ls space period period. That means list the, the directory behind the one that we currently are in, which is the, if we go present working directory, because we need to figure out what work directory we're in, var www html. So we know that var www has our flag in it, right? Because we were in this directory, it's not in here. And then we went back a directory and there it was. And the reason I covered URL encoding quickly is because if you if this doesn't work, it, you normally shouldn't be able to put spaces in your URLs. If you can't, then use URL encoding and you, you can put a space in there. So now all we got to do is say cat and go back one and say flag.txt and hit enter and there's your flag. Boom. Very simple, very fun. All right. Last but not least, the mitigating SQL injections. I'm gonna cover this quickly, but I'm not gonna dive deep into this because of the fact that they only spend a little bit of time showing you, and then the skill assessment is the actual um, SQL injection. This is a SQL injection box. It's not really a whole lot about um, mitigating, but you do need to understand mitigation to at least be able to bypass some of it. So th there's a couple things they're gonna show you. So input sanit sanitization, this is the first one. So there is no sanitization in this code here, but what you can see is as we go through, they're gonna actually put um, sanitization. So what you can see, libraries provide multiple functions to achieve this. One such example is the MySQL real escape string. This function escapes characters such as commas and apostrophe, or apostrophes, excuse me, and quotes. So they don't hold any special meaning. So now, as you can see, when we run it and we put these, you can see when they put these quotes in there it doesn't mean anything it doesn't now because if you remember at the beginning we had to match the quotes right we had to match them perfectly we had to make sure that they all matched and we had balancing as we called it right well this library this mysql real escape string library allows you to say hey if somebody puts a quote or a quote or a uh, um, quote or a comma in there or apostrophe not i keep saying comma but apostrophe if we keep putting them in there it doesn't mean anything. Take it as a string. Don't take it as um, to to end the quotes for the query. So that's one thing. So sanitization, meaning get rid of the, the special characters that people are putting in there. Now, next one, input validation. This is validating what people are typing in. So for instance, I can say, hey, if you're supposed to be typing an email in here, only accept something if it has at whatever.com. If it doesn't, don't accept it. 
right? So that's input validation. That's very easy. So you can see here, same thing here, has to match a certain pattern. So here you can see it has to match A through Z, A through Z, right? So it has to be a text. Otherwise, it's going to say input valid. Boom. Okay. Then the next one, and then you can see here is the same thing with the match. And then you can see the code is modified to use the preg match function, which checks if the input matches the given pattern or not. The pattern is A through Z, which will only match strings containing letters and spaces. Pretty easy, right? Any other characters will result in termination of the script. So if you try to bypass it, boom, get rid of it. Now, some of you may say, and then you can see they tested it because they put one, two, three, four. And if you remember, they're only supposed to accept A through Z. And when they put one, two, three, four, we got nothing. Now, some of you may say this seems really easy. Well, let's keep covering it and then we'll talk about why it's not. So user privileges, this is again, pretty simple. If you make everyone has the least amount of privilege that they need, then even if somebody accidentally does get a SQL injection, that account that is running that SQL Davis can't really do anything on the machine anyway. So it's not a big deal if they get it. I don't want to say it's not a big deal. They shouldn't get it, but it's not as big a deal. So just know that if you have the correct permission set, then it's much harder for somebody to take advantage of this. Um, because as you can see, if you limit it to only allowing the accounts to read what they need, then there's not a chance that they're going to get um, the backend users and database and all that stuff that they're not supposed to read. For instance, never have root run your um, script or your uh, database, excuse me. Now, web application firewall, this is um, pretty standard nowadays. So what it does is you put a web application firewall that also adds a layer of protection and actually stops certain packets coming in. So you can say, hey, if you see certain IPs, stop them. If you see certain um, queries, don't allow them to come through if you see whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Web application firewall, you can put all kinds of rules in there to stop them before they ever hit the server. So now, and then parameter, parameterized queries. So this is basically saying right here, the query is modified to contain two placeholders. So the query is already pre-made for you and it's got parameters in there, right? See the parameters? Okay. So they're marked with a question mark where the username and password will be placed. We then bind the username and password to the query using this bind parameter. Boom. Right. This will safely escape any quotes because it will only take these and put them in this location as a placeholder. Meaning we can't say, oh, hey, comment this out because even if you tried, we're going to have another one be put in place. So it's similar. Basically what they're saying is we're going to control where it can be placed in a query versus you manipulating the query itself. Again, so I talked about why these are not very easy to actually do. Um, what I mean by that is these are easy to do relatively, meaning if you have one server, two servers, whatever, but when you're managing a lot of servers, it's very easy to stand something up and keep moving and totally just forget to put this validation in. And even, and a lot of people always say, well, people shouldn't forget validation. Security is number one, right? If you're a database admin or something like that, your job is not security. Your job is to get a database up and working. So your job, you're not even thinking at the time you're thinking, I know how to get that up and working and I got to get to the next thing. So I don't blame database admins or certain people for um, security issues in some of these databases. Do I wish everybody was 100% security minded? Of course, but that's just not realistic. So take it with what you will, but it's not as easy as you think because people, it's just life. People get moving, people get going, and it's hard to make sure 100% that all your code is sanitized and, and proper and valid and all that. So. Let me know what you guys think. Hopefully this helps you guys. And then the next video I'm going to release this week, I'm going to get it out this week, is the skill assessment. And once that skill assessment's done, we will actually move on and I will just put them all together, make one giant video out of it. So that way you guys can um, watch that as well. So let me know what you guys think. Hopefully you guys have a good one and thank it.